Minus 37? Yeah, that's, that's pretty cold. Well, would you go outside in that? No, me neither. Oh, fun fact. You know what? You know the daily high temperature on Mars gets warmer than that sometimes? Yeah, Mars, the, the planet, Mars. <laughs> but they're still going to fight. Oh, that's not going to go well. Okay. December 5th, 1941. Germany invaded the Soviet Union June 22nd. And now, nearly six months later, they have been relentlessly driving towards Moscow week after week after week. And this week, on the doorstep of Moscow, with the whole world watching, the German drive is stopped. It has failed. It is over. I'm Indy Nidell. This is an extremely long episode of World War II. Last week, Operation Crusader continued in North Africa. Axis Commander Elvin Rommel made a daring armored dash for the Egyptian border, but Allied Commander Claude Auchinleck made an equally daring decision to keep up his own attacks, and units from the besieged Tobruk garrison managed to make contact with relief forces. The Kido Butai, Japan's carrier fleet, the world's largest, is sailing east across the Pacific Ocean towards Hawaii, and the Germans are still driving towards Moscow, though it's getting more and more difficult with every day that passes. And further south, the Soviets retook Rostov, the biggest German loss of the whole offensive so far. On the 29th, an 18-year-old Russian girl is hanged by the Germans. A card around her neck reads, she set fire to houses. According to an article in Pravda, so you may have to take the exact wording with a grain of salt, her last words at the scaffold are to the German soldiers, you can't hang all 190 million of us. Also that day, Dr. Fritz Tott, in charge of infrastructure restoration in the occupied USSR and Inspector General for Water and Energy, returns to Berlin and tells Adolf Hitler, given the arms and industrial supremacy of the Anglo-Saxon powers, we can no longer militarily win this war. But the Wehrmacht is very much trying. Erich Hepner's 4th Panzers take Krasnaya Poliana November 30th and are now within artillery range of Moscow. In the morning of December 1st, Gunther von Kluge's 4th Army launches a furious attempt to take the shortest route to Moscow, the Minsk-Moscow Highway. By noon, the Soviets have been pushed back several kilometers and the Germans are 7 kilometers from the highway. Should they reach the highway? and split the Soviet 5th and 33rd armies. Well, Soviet commander Georgi Zhukov cannot let that happen, so he throws everything he has left into the breach. On December 2nd, a German combat engineer patrol reaches Kimki on a scouting mission. This is the closest the Germans get to Moscow. In a deep and terrible freeze-up, with German soldiers screaming in the snow that they could not go on, Yefremov attacked on December 2nd in the yushkovo bertsevo area. By the evening of December 4th, the situation was practically restored to what it had been four days ago. The last German bid for Moscow had failed. Already at the end of November, Zhukov and his staff considered that they had one in the northwest. The German advance slowed to one measured in single meters. German reserves exhausted. Guderian was still bumping up against Kashira. Von Kluge's thrust had been a deadly one, perfectly aimed, but it had finally been parried. And also, already at the end of November, Zhukov had given Stavka plans for his counteroffensive, a massive one to destroy the armored wedges the Germans had jammed into the Red Army positions. Four armies would attack to the northwest towards Istra, and two armies and the 1st Cavalry Corps would attack Heinz Guderian for the south from three sides. Four armies would hold the center and prevent transfers to the flanks. Joseph Stalin wants to make this offensive even bigger, adding Ivan Konev's forces further north and Semyon Timoshenko's further south to the mix. On the 4th, the temperature falls to minus 37 degrees on the Moscow front. Both German Army Group Center Commander Fedor von Bock and Army Commander-in-Chief Walter von Brauchisch are now ill and cannot fully perform their duties. Blizzards have begun. Tanks will not start. Guns will not fire. By this time, it was clear to everyone, German and Soviet alike, that the Wehrmacht had been stretched to the breaking point and was no longer capable of continuing the offensive. Unbeknownst to German commanders, while their strength was eroding, 
the Red Army's strength was increasing. And at 3 a.m. on December 5th, the last day of the week, the Red Army counteroffensive begins to drive the Germans back along an 800-kilometer line from Kalinin to Yelets. The Soviets have already been advancing in the south, though. On the 30th, German Army Group South Commander Gerd von Rundstedt resigns his command. Okay, he's kind of relieved of it, since Hitler had refused to allow him to pull back from Rostov, and he had anyway. Walter von Reichenau takes over, but he does just what Rundstedt would have done and withdraws behind the Meuse River. The Germans are soon forced back to Mariupol, but they are consolidating in the Crimea. And a note from the north of the Eastern Front. On December 2nd, the Soviets finish evacuating their garrison from Hanko Peninsula, which they've occupied for 18 months. It's been under siege by the Finns since the end of June. Some 23,000 troops are taken by transport to Leningrad, itself under siege, though two transports and three destroyers are lost to coastal artillery and Finnish minefields. Another siege, the Allied one at Tobruk, also sees developments this week. By the 30th, Axis leader Erwin Rommel has taken the Ed Duda City Rezeg Belhamed Triangle and isolated Tobruk once again. But to the east, at the border, his forces are pinned down on defense. And the whole operation has turned into a war of attrition that he cannot possibly win, since the Allies can consistently bring in reserves and reinforcements, and he cannot. Meanwhile, the Allies regroup and prepare for a renewed offensive. There is confused fighting the rest of the week. See, Rommel is trying to simultaneously maintain the hold on Tobruk, hurt the British armor regrouping further south, and send aid to the Axis garrisons at Bardia, Solom, and Halfaya Pass. His forces are not strong enough to do all this, and it just makes things worse. On the 4th, he begins withdrawing from the eastern perimeter of Tobruk. The next day, Hitler orders the transfer of all of Flieger Corps II from the Eastern Front to the Mediterranean. This is specifically to reduce the effectiveness of the British Malta forces sabotaging Axis supply convoys and to provide more help for Rommel in the field. The active war is soon to get quite a bit bigger, if you can believe it. Japan, already at war with China, is going to make war on Britain, the Netherlands, and the United States as well. The liaison and imperial conferences early in the week officially decide that Japan is going to war, though really it's already been decided. And if you think anything could have dissuaded Japanese Prime Minister Hideki Tojo from his course the last two months, then I have a bridge in Brooklyn for sale. Cheap. Already the 30th, Japanese troop transports are spotted off Borneo. Other such reports around the region lead to serious apprehension in British Malaya and the Dutch East Indies. December 1st, the British declare a state of emergency in Malaya as Japanese troop transports cross the South China Sea. On the 2nd, British ships Prince of Wales and Repulse arrive in Singapore with four destroyers. The carrier Indomitable, with nine hurricane fighters, is supposed to be with them, but it ran aground and repairs will take nearly a month. A side note, those British ships have the codename Force Z. Operation Z is the codename for the Japanese plan to attack Pearl Harbor by complete and total surprise. Though that day, a telegram is sent from Tokyo to the Japanese consulate in Hawaii asking if there are barrage balloons over Pearl Harbor and if they use torpedo nets there. Washington decodes this, but to them, it is a routine intelligence inquiry. Because there is nothing in Operation Z that is not actually at least somewhat familiar to the Americans. This past summer, Hawaiian Army Air Commander Frederick Martin sent the War Department a memo asking for more planes to guard against what he saw as a worst-case scenario, the employment of six enemy carriers against Oahu simultaneously, each approaching on a different course. But that's a guy proposing what just about everyone sees as the unlikeliest thing ever. First, why would Japan attack at Hawaii anyhow? That's not going to lift the embargo. And what threat is the Pacific Fleet to Japan? None. I mean, they don't even have tankers and things necessary to wage any campaign all the way across the Pacific, even if they wanted to, and they know that Japan knows this. 
And the chief of staff of the U.S. Army, George Marshall, calls Hawaii the strongest fortress in the world. Back in May, after visiting Oahu, he wrote a report to President Franklin Roosevelt saying that with merely adequate air defense, enemy carriers and escorts and transports will begin to come under air attack at a distance of 750 miles. And that any attack on Oahu is not just far-fetched, it's impractical. Roosevelt is a naval enthusiast, but certainly not any sort of forward-thinking one. His thoughts on naval warfare echo most of America's and Japan's high commands that decisive naval battles are won by sending out loads of capital ships and overpowering the enemy with superior force. Aircraft carriers are so little thought of at this point that they are not capital ships. Battleships are the big guns that win naval battles. And anyhow, Hawaii takes a real back seat to America's main strategic zone, the Philippines. It is a show of force there that is to be the deterrent to Japan attacking the Dutch East Indies. This is a fairly recent development. America's Rainbow Five strategy was Atlantic oriented and Marshall thought sending more force to the Philippines on Japan's doorstep was just what Germany would like to see the US do. But early in 1941, when Japan increased forces in Formosa, he and a lot of other anti-Pacific hardliners softened a bit and by late May, they were up for installing 12-inch coastal batteries to protect Luzon. The breakdown of American-Japanese negotiations in June gave irreversible momentum to the political and military advocates who wanted to set the U.S. Pacific defense line more than 5,000 miles west of its original boundary at Hawaii. Marshall is now singing this tune. It became an actual crisis in late July when Japan invaded southern Indochina. On July 26th, in response, Roosevelt froze Japanese assets and recalled General Douglas MacArthur to active duty to mobilize the Philippine Army, as we saw. On August 14th, the War Plans Division called for MacArthur to get more reinforcements. The present attitude of Japan indicates she may consider a reduction of the Philippine Islands a prior requirement to commencement of other plans for expansion. The plan called for sending heavy bombers to Luzon right away. Unlike shipping, they can avoid Japanese patrols and maintain secrecy by flying through New Guinea and Darwin, and they also wouldn't divert any transport shipping from the Atlantic. The B-17 bomber is the War Department's favorite baby, the plane of the future. The Flying Fortress has the weapons to fight off enemy fighters and a 1600 kilometer range, so they think it makes daytime precision bombing practical. Now, actual bombing runs this summer over Germany with B-17s given to Britain under Lend-Lease were less than spectacular. Eight of 20 crashed or were shot down, and only two bombs were estimated to have hit their targets. Joseph Goebbels called them flying coffins, and there were issues with icing up, with the turbochargers, and even with the oxygen. The American investigating team, though, blamed the British crews for flying 10,000 feet too high. They had not used the correct bomb site because it's a national secret, and Boeing then made redesigns and fixes. So when Marshall, and Secretary of War Henry Stimson see them a few weeks later in action, the demonstrations that were laid on not only completely restored their faith in the B-17 by Boeing, but convinced them that the U.S. had at last found the solution to defending the Philippines as well as affording the chance to take the offensive against Japan if necessary. By September 12th, nine have arrived, and MacArthur is told he will have 128 of them by February 1942. The U.S. asks the fighting allies about putting them in places like Vladivostok, Malaya, and Borneo. Stalin balks at this because even though they'd be in bombing range of Tokyo, he doesn't want to give the Japanese any excuse for attacking Siberia. The others are enthusiastic. Stimson writes that the U.S. would soon have enough air power to prevent Japan from any movement across the limited space of the South China Sea. And if they try to avoid being destroyed there by planes from the Philippines and go east around those islands, the fleet would then have time to send battleships from Pearl Harbor. And though he thinks the Philippines to be the major obstacle to southern Japanese attack, they themselves are not, to the War Department, a major target of conquest, since 
That would be a serious undertaking and it would not gain Japan the resources they need anyhow and they would bring the US into open war. On October 1st, MacArthur reports optimistically he will soon have 200,000 men ready for combat. And when he sees the Rainbow Five war plan that mandates a retreat to the Bataan Peninsula in case of hostilities, he calls on the planning board to change the strategy since the B-17s have changed the whole game. There are some issues with this optimism. The total coastline of the Philippines is longer than that of the entire United States. The Commonwealth Army has neither the training, the equipment, nor the experience of the Japanese Army, and it won't be until May 1942 that MacArthur gets everything he wants, assuming no Japanese attack anywhere. And by November, Marshall is worrying that Japan might not wait that long, given the rate the US is sending reinforcements across the Pacific. Japan has a consulate on the Philippines. They do know that the US is seriously beefing up the Philippines with bombers. They're kind of supposed to know. I mean, it can't be a deterrent if they have no idea there's any force there to deter them. It's even sort of intentionally leaked. On the 15th, Marshall calls a DC senior press correspondence conference and tells them of their newspaper's need for secrecy about the movement of heavy bombers to the Philippines. He says MacArthur is getting the greatest concentration of bomber force in the world and he does not want to arouse Tokyo. However, he already has. That same morning, the Japanese consulate in the Philippines gets a message to investigate the rate of bomber arrival and which routes they come by. This is intercepted because it's in a diplomatic code the US has broken, so Marshall and Naval Chief Harold Stark decide to send more fighters to Wake and Midway Islands by carrier from Pearl so that the next flight of B-17s in early December to the Philippines will be protected when it comes within range of Japanese attack from the Marshall Islands. So the carrier Enterprise with Task Force 8 is sent to ferry 12 Wildcats to Wake Island and the carrier Lexington and Task Force 12 is sent with 18 Vindicators for Midway Island. Enterprise was sent as last week ended and is scheduled to return to Pearl Harbor the morning of the 7th. Lexington is sent now on the 5th. And this week of foreboding comes to an end. If you follow Spartacus on the War Against Humanity series, you will know foreboding as in when SS Sturmbannführer Karl Jäger reports that his unit has now murdered 150,000 Jews in Lithuania, which is only 15% of all the Jewish men, women and children that will have been slaughtered on the Eastern Front by the end of this year. It is foreboding because it will only get worse. There is also foreboding in the USSR as Germany is halted and the Soviets begin a massive counteroffensive. There is foreboding in North Africa as Rommel realizes he can't do everything he wants to do and there is foreboding in Southeast Asia as the world watches Japanese transports in the South China Sea with bated breath. Henry Stimson, again, he's the American Secretary of War, writes in his diary, what I am roughly paraphrasing now with help from John Costello. What Stimson wants and what he keeps urging Roosevelt and the State Department to do is to spin out diplomatic negotiations with Japan for another six months or so. Once the US is in a position to seriously threaten major Japanese cities with strategic bombing, then the balance of power in the Pacific will have shifted. By April 1942, the buildup on the Philippines will be finished and when the battleships Britain has promised to send arrive, which they should have by then, then for the first time, Anglo-American military power will finally be enough to stop Japan's march south and secure the safety of Singapore. Six months. That's all they need. Six months. Six months ago, almost, Germany kicked off Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union. If you'd like to see a special about some logistical challenges they faced, you can click right here for that any minute now. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Patrick Quinn. Be like Patrick and join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com so we can continue to bring you this content. And hey, don't miss all of our daily posts on Instagram and Facebook. Links are below. And click subscribe and I will see you next time.